No, I mean, architecture is political. We gotta, we gotta add that stuff. Indeed. We are tearing down communities to build multifamily and you have to understand we are creating displacement. You're displacing black and brown folks and they don't come back. Half of this podcast would be dedicated to the history of Tyler House my journey and my discoveries and hey i'm gonna solve this housing problem hey guys what's up my name is melissa daniels this is the architectural political podcast where black and brown folks talk about architecture i hope you enjoyed this podcast and be part of my storytelling welcome to season three of the architectural political podcast i created intro theme You'll hear this in every episode. And I fought this for a long time. I didn't want to have an intro. I was just wanted to just music and then me jump into the conversation. I'm going to try it out for this season to see how I like it or don't like it. It's common for other people to do it. And I was trying to fight against the grain. Actually, this was supposed to be my trailer. I don't like my trailer. So I wanted to try to make it more entertaining I guess and then I was like no I like this more for my intro than my trailer because I felt like my trailer explains the process and I'm still going to work on my trailer and maybe not till the next episode of season three that I'll have a chance to introduce you guys to my new trailer nevertheless about this very first episode of season three I got a chance to talk to Chris Demrick he's my Twitter buddy we'll have conversations here and there and he'll bring up something or I bring up something and we'll have a conversation he does advocacy and political works in architecture and I just wanted to have a conversation about architecture and politics because you know architecture is political get it and the fact that he minored in political science while doing architecture he went to school at Tulane University in Louisiana shout out to uh, Scott Ruff Amber Wiley and Brian Bradshaw your names were discussed several times in this episode so you guys did a great job in raising Chris (laughs) I guess I don't know but you were and are is appreciated in all the works that you do. I also want to let you know that there were some Zoom problems. You get like the Hertz sound. I think that's the best way to describe it. I try to take it out as best as I can. You mostly get it in the beginning. So some of his words, I again, I try to tweak it as much as I can. So hopefully you can understand the context of what he's saying. I want to preface that. We talked about architecture education, the historical aspects of Louisiana. We talked about architecture obviously. I wanted to start off this season more about politics and I felt like I haven't really dived into politics of architecture or how it intertwines or especially the political science part, the history. My plans for this season or this year stems from what I wanted to do last year, but I didn't have the time. Oh, speaking of time, that kind of prevented me from producing more episodes was working with three other women with uh, writing the Vortex and getting the application in for the Whitney M. Young Awards. That literally took us a year to do. We met every month, a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of digressing here, but I just wanted to share this real quick. We met every month to formulate this application. Like it was really, to me, it was intense putting together this application for this particular AIA award. Some of my time was spent doing that. Some of my time was spent regular everyday works and other little projects that are still coming together that when it's complete, again, I'll let you guys know about that. But as far as this podcast, I always have big ideas of what I want to do. And it's just finding the time, dedicating the time to to do it. I want to go back to a weekly type episode thing. That's my goal. But as always, life happens and I will try my best to keep to a regular schedule but don't hold me on that I love you as a listener listeners unfortunately 
I don't have a rigid schedule. I will make every effort to make every single episode as informative as I could possibly can to provide you with new knowledge and and new perspectives on everything that's architectural, political, black and brown related. At the beginning of this episode, I make a reference to, uh, I'm kind of loud in the beginning, so you may want to lower your volumes just for like, um, just for like 30 seconds. I say, warm it up, Chris. And Chris was like, okay. I make a reference to Chris Cross because, you know, and I say a couple of lines of that, but he has no idea who Chris Cross is. <laughs> it's like, that was my childhood crush. Oh my gosh, Chris Cross. That should tell you how old I am in that ancient 1900s reference I just made about Chris Cross and it's it's interesting their style of dress and then the name Chris Cross they would wear their jeans on backwards their hats on backwards their shirts on backwards <laughs> it's just when you think about it, it's like the silliest thing but anyways it's that was that was the 90s guys so anyway here you go what up Chris <laughs> did you get that at all that reference moment up Chris I'm about to moment up Chris that's what you were born to do Crisscross? Nope. nope. Nothing. Because I'm old. 90s child? Nope. Was it 90s? I was born in 1994. Yeah, I'm old. Okay, thanks. I don't know any Chris Brown ones then. Yeah, Maybe. No. Ugh. Sorry. But anyway, how you doing, Chris? I'm doing pretty good today. <laughs> not too not too bad. Not too bad. So we're here to just talk, get to know a little bit about you, get into some politics and architecture. Mm-hmm. Reach out to you because we talk on Twitter a lot. We converse on Twitter. And I was like, what a better person to get than to talk about architects and politics than a guy who actually studied political science in college or university, I should say. So Mm -hmm. let's start with high school. You're from Austin, Texas. And there was a realization that happened to you. You want to talk a little bit about that? An awakening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to go back a little bit more than that to to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, which is where my mom's family is from. So it was in seventh grade and then going into high school when I first had some teachers who were prompting me to think a bit more critically about history and identity. And I went to a magnet public school on Austin's east side, which has been the historic Black and Mexican-American neighborhoods of the city at that time. It was gentrifying a bit, and now it's gentrified so much and has become so white that it would be very difficult to recognize today. But at that time, I was like, even as a younger person interested in space and cities, at least a little bit aware of those things, and then had teachers who taught about, particularly my seventh grade English teacher, the civil rights movement in the South, which was something that I was aware that my grandparents would have experienced as people living in Montgomery, Alabama in the 50s, that my mom would have experienced being born in 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama. But I hadn't really like thought to talk to them about it until I had an assignment from my seventh grade English teacher to do an oral history project with them. And I started to get into questions about like, well, they're white in Alabama. They're also Jews in Alabama. And what do these different identities mean? How did they or didn't they respond to civil rights activism happening at the time in that place? And then as my grandmother, who was a public school teacher in Montgomery from, I think about the 60s through the 80s, would talk about saying things like, well, things actually haven't changed as much as you think. I think it was hearing from her, someone I trusted a lot. She lived in Austin by that time. They'd retired and moved to Texas after my parents had me and my brother. I think I was prompted by learning from her to think more critically about race and identity than I would have otherwise been in addition to my middle school and high school teachers. And for high school, like the racial divide was stark and I would say architectural at my high school where I went to a magnet program on the second floor with mostly white and Asian American students. And on the first floor was a neighborhood program for students who were coming from the area around the school which was a Black and Latinx neighborhood with a lot of Mexican, Central American immigrants. And 
sort of the conventional wisdom around the school was that the smart kids were on the top and the dumb kids were on the bottom. And it would sort of seem to be that way if you didn't have classes across the schools, which there weren't opportunity. I sort of started out the first couple of years of my time there believing in the superiority of the school that we had on the second floor, thinking it was obvious that, well, we must be smarter or else we wouldn't be in these classes. But I started to read a little bit more books I got from my grandparents about civil rights, started to take some inspiration from teachers who would sort of around the edges of regular Texas history curriculum talk about social justice a bit more until I got to my senior year when I worked with some other people who I wrote the school newspaper with to do sort of an investigation on why our school was segregated the way that it was, though we didn't use those kind of words because no one really suggested that we do it. And we were discouraged from using words like segregation as well. We just talked about things like division. But 2012, which was my senior year of high school, was also the year that Trayvon Martin was murdered. And so that was, he was, would have been a year younger than I was. That was something that me and my classmates were a bit aware of, was like the the ways, because we talked about it in our investigation of what was happening in the school, that Black students who came from downstairs to upstairs, where the white school was, were profiled for being in the hallways and sent back downstairs. It was kind of my first, I would say, real understanding of how space is racialized would probably have come for about that time. Then I came to, high, to college in New Orleans, which is probably, I hate to use like hyperbolic terms, like New Orleans is the most racist city in America. New Orleans is the most racialized city in America. But rather than that, I'll just say New Orleans is a city that's very important to come to if you want to learn about how race and space operate. In addition to race and class and space and gender and space, there's a lot to learn here just from both academic study of the city and living here as a person beside being an academic or a teacher. So in high school, I ran track and played football with some people who come from New Orleans after Katrina had been displaced from the city and then their family settled in Austin. And so I went to middle school and high school, probably with a dozen students who I knew particularly were from New Orleans. And when I talked about going to Tulane as a possibility, I just heard such wonderful things about the city. And I was a little bit conscious at the time that like my experience of it as a white college student was going to be very different than theirs was as black, not only like black people growing up in the city, but had been black children and that their memories were coming from like pre-Katrina and that there was something very different about New Orleans now versus what it was like then. But still just being told about what a great place it was and even kind of hearing positive things about Tulane from the perspective of black kids who grown up in the city was really encouraging to me in coming here. And then I actually got here and I am will forever be thankful to some of the people I was around in orientation who pushed me and sort of the emerging questions that I had about race and class and the city of New Orleans and Tulane into going to a multicultural orientation the first week that I was here because that sort of sent me on a track into a campus organization called Students Organizing Against Racism. And that's where I had my first real exposure to anti-racist education in like 2012-13 through a New Orleans-based training organization called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond through other kinds of workshops and trainings. I think I've kind of understand over time that like anything else you have to learn about racism and white supremacy to understand it as a white person and that information was just systematically kept for me and wasn't really being taught to me at Tulane with a couple notable exceptions but it was these academic or these spaces outside academia, these organizing workshops and these places in the city as opposed to on the campus, which is where I got to learn what I consider most important during my time here. When you were back in high school, how was your neighborhood growing up? Did it reflect your high school? Not at all. I grew up in a very white neighborhood who's one of the main streets into it. It's called Robert E. Lee Drive. It was planned and built in the 50s and it It was a very liberal neighborhood, but white liberalism is the kind of politics that would mean that people wouldn't challenge the street being called Robert E. Lee Drive in our neighborhood. I wouldn't question why the neighborhood was probably at least 95% white and had been for its entire existence. So I went to a very white elementary school and then in the neighborhood and magnet middle school and a magnet high school. Those schools is where I first was around people who were differently racialized for me. 
but not necessarily in the same classes because of academic tracking and the different opportunities at like the upstairs magnet high school and the downstairs neighborhood high school, which is also like 40 minutes away on the entire other side of the city in a very different neighborhood. So yeah, definitely having to go all the way across town to go to high school was an experience that taught me a lot about the city. I'm grateful for it, but I also recognize I don't have the naive, and that is not naive as I used to be. Like I used to assume that there was a benefit to that for both high schools, but now I recognize it was really, it's a benefit for the white students who get to come and possibly learn a bit more about the world and going to that school. But because Black and Latinx students at the downstairs school couldn't take classes with teachers who were paid a lot and well-experienced, often they didn't get to benefit from that relationship. Though they also had some great teachers. Why architecture? Well, let's see. I like to draw buildings. Like as long as I could possibly remember, really. I was told that that's what you did if you like to draw buildings. My parents are journalists and they worked around the state capitol a lot. You know, if you've uh, been to Austin, the state capitol is right in the middle of the city. It's a big pink granite Romanesque Italianate kind of building from the 1880s. So I spent a lot of time around that building growing up. I would also say that's probably one reason why I'm interested in politics too. And the intersection of politics and architecture is having spent a lot of time around a very political building as a child. But I was inspired by those kind of buildings that I have been around. In fact, I like to draw, I like to draw them. I was definitely learned a lot of pictures of buildings. It's like my dad had all these stock photo catalogs from his job. And so I would just look through them and see pictures of buildings and cities all over the world. And I would draw them sometimes. But I don't think I knew what architecture was besides drawing buildings. So, so started... architecture, not an artist, right? Yeah, no, I don't think artist was ever really a career that I considered because it wasn't something my parents would have been into, really. I wasn't even aware that there was like a such thing as a professional artist, I don't think. So have you ever met an architect when you were in high school? I had been to the University of Texas open house at their architecture school when I was a younger kid. And then I think I had like met a professor there. I remember going there to visit at their architecture school and like having a meeting about college there. I was told it was very competitive and I probably wasn't going to get in. I don't think I did. And then I also worked for an architect for a summer in high school who my parents knew who just did fancy rich people's houses. So as far as I knew, like that's kind of what it was. And for some reason, I didn't question it at that time. I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what it is. I guess I had read other books. I was a big fan of the old Austin Public Library. No one's even better, but the old one I would go to when I was a very young kid and just check out the same architecture books again and again. So I had that understanding of architecture too. But still, I just saw like the buildings and maybe some of the people and I didn't know the process at all. You're in Tulane now. Mm -hmm. He joined a couple of organizations. Did you see anything in architectural education that was kind of off or it was okay and you just went through it or? Man, my class as I'm sure a lot of people do, uh, dwindled a lot from the beginning of the first year to the end. Probably was down by like 60, started a little over 100 people, I want to say, and then it was down to like 60 by the end of the first year. But again, believing in a meritocracy, as I had in high school, I think I and other people who stuck around thought that like, oh, this is just, we belong here. We are the ones who will make it to be architects. The other people just don't have what it takes, which is a really toxic idea. But at the time, I don't think we questioned it that much, probably because we were the ones who had won. I did that with air quotes for the listeners. And yeah, we believed a lot in our own ability. I think like Tulane was a pretty competitive place to get into, it seemed like, or at least so we thought being there. And so, well, if we're there, we must be worthy. That was the attitude, I think, around me and the people I was with. And the whiteness of the school in a city as black and New Orleans as New Orleans didn't really didn't really make itself clear to me initially. I think my understanding of race, of like my own whiteness and institutional whiteness was like starting to develop at that time, but it wasn't it took me a couple of years to understand how what I was learning in these organizing spaces related to my architecture education. Certainly not in the first year. What happened in the second year though was I had a professor named Scott Ruff, who I hope maybe if you listen to this, hey, Scott, if you do, wouldn't be surprised if you do. Scott was, for the record, the greatest professor I ever had. There's a lot of other good ones, but Scott's really a truly wonderful like human and teacher. 
I don't think I would be going into teaching now if it wasn't for him just being a kind and generous person with his time and energy. And just like both demystifying a lot of the teaching process and like mentoring effectively and introducing me to the idea that architecture is political, which I, despite being in these organizing spaces, despite starting a political science degree, I don't think I would have put it together if not for Scott introducing me to that idea through studio and then a seminar I took with him in third year. I will say I had Scott Ruff for studio and then also Dr. Amber Wiley for history, which is a crazy, like as unlikely as it is to have one professor who's black and teaches sort of black history version of architecture and a version that like incorporates a more comprehensive canon that has the accomplishments accomplishments of people of African descent in it and acknowledges what that means in New Orleans. Having two professors who are doing that in the same year is like really unlikely. Here at Tulane in that time, there was Scott and Amber and also Maurice Cox, who was the coordinator of second year studio, I believe, at that time. And so there was a curriculum that was really teaching an uncommonly politicized and uncommonly black idea of architecture, I think, particularly for a school as white as Tulane. But uh, yeah, I wonder all the time what exactly the intents of that were and how of that curriculum that they created was, particularly for the studio I took in the spring of my second year. And I mean, I know they were thinking critically about it as a curriculum, mostly being taught to white students, because that's what we were. But as a design educator now looking to deconstruct white supremacy through teaching, I would just love to take a time machine back and sit in a curriculum planning session with them and like learn about how they were thinking of that at the time. Because yeah, that showed me that it was possible. No one could ever tell me it's not because I saw it and I learned from it. And yeah, I am very grateful for what they did. At the same time, I got relatively good education from other professors, just about other fundamental architecture things. Like I gained a healthy appreciation for Louis Kahn as a designer from another professor, John Klingman. There was some there was some good people there, but then also some like really toxic, traditionally white supremacist, patriarchal people who promote an unhealthy academic culture, which promotes an unhealthy work culture, which leads to the problems we have in our profession today. How many uh, black students graduated with you? What ended up being a graduating class of around probably 35 from my undergrad, what had I'd started with, mm -hmm. I think because I did a five-year MRC arc, the undergrad class had two black men in it. And then the graduate class, which if you added us together, I think it would probably be about 45 or 50, had another black man who was Brian Bradshaw, which is how we came to know each other because we took a studio together. In okay. Going to the poli sci part of it. How was that? I took one poli sci class. It was just like intro because I was thinking about doing a, a minor in that. And I remember in that class, I was like, what do you have me reading? Why do I care about the Bill of Rights again? It was really difficult for me. So how was your experience with that? It was fascinating. So my interest in political science as a discipline kind of came from having had a high school government teacher who later years would show as a terrible Republican jerk. But at the time when I was in high school, 2011, 2012, and took his classes, he was a provocateur pushing all the liberal children at the magnet part of my high school to question our assumptions. And so I think I actually entered political science with a somewhat weird centrist viewpoint of like, well, I believe this liberal orthodoxy from Austin, but also what if I'm actually kind of a free thinker? And I can't believe I thought those things now. But teachers matter a lot. And yeah. like the charismatic teachers, the ones who make things exciting and interesting, we pick up on what they're telling us. And I think it was probably that teacher who inspired me to study politics. I got there. It was really nice, honestly, to have a break from architecture and to be in rooms with people who I didn't know from my architecture classes and pick up another set of friends outside studio. So I started it because I had an intellectual interest in it, but I definitely stuck with it in part because it was a, another social world of people doing electoral politics things and advocacy and activist things. And I can credit that partly with having gotten me through architecture school because the culture of architecture school can be cultish, to say it nicely. Political science 
in the politics world in New Orleans that also started to introduce me to the city as a whole and got me off campus more often for different kinds of politics events and campaign work and stuff. Like that. Did you see any marriage between architecture and political science when you were in school? Yeah. So initially... I started to think about it in terms of public works, public architecture, the kinds of things that you would see in the city's capital projects budget, fire stations, schools, police stations, city halls, on the high architectural end, some things like government buildings, but fancy government buildings, courthouses or city halls, but on the lower end, just the everyday buildings that make society function that government pays for. I think I started to see as a function of architectural, to a lesser extent, planning process. And planning, we can talk more about later too, and how I got into planning a bit more because there's not a program for it at Tulane. But I think that if you combine enough urban politics and urban studies education, which is the track I ended up going on in political science with architecture, you eventually get to some kind of planning type disciplinary orientation. I had the political theory in the first few years, and that was really exciting at first because it combined history with a more contemporary viewpoint. And these were the political debates of 150 years ago, and these are how they're relevant now, particularly about the civil war and race in the U.S. I will say I went through an entire political science education without once having a real discussion that I can remember about reconstruction, or reading anything by W.E.B. Du Bois, which wow. when I now look at it is absolutely outrageous and a huge gap in the education that I received and paid good money for it. And like, that's crazy, but not surprising given what Tulane exists to do as an institution. Oh, you read? A lot of stuff by like real racist political philosophers with some discussion of like, yeah, this is the philosophies that were shaping Southern thought before the Civil War. And I'm honestly glad that I read those things now because I feel I can understand right-wing contemporary politics a lot better for having done it. But it is also real bad that we didn't talk about Reconstruction. It's bad that no one talks about Reconstruction because no one's taught about it. But yeah, I learned a lot of obscure early 19th century Southern political philosophers. It's hard for me to wrap my head around that. I can't imagine not talking about Reconstruction in the South. Yeah. In what I've since learned is more or less be hyperbolic, but like maybe the most important city to reconstruction history in yeah. the Mechanics Institute massacre happened here. Like the first black elected congressman wasn't seated, but he was elected was from New Orleans. First black lieutenant governor in American history was from Louisiana, based in New Orleans. It's yeah, a really shocking exclusion. And I've Come far enough, I think, to be able to label it an exclusion. It's very intentional. None of it's accidental. Kind of to pull in the architecture a little bit. In Whitney Young's 1968 speech to the AIA, he talks about the thunderous silence and complete indifference of white architecture. But then in another paragraph, I think one or two before that, he talks about this didn't happen by accident. It was carefully planned. And when I give presentations about that speech, I like to show that line, not the other one that everyone knows, because I think, yeah, it's one thing to be silent and indifferent, but that doesn't happen by accident. It happens because it's planned. I got a book recommendation if people out there listen and like to check out what's on the non-Amazon book buying internet. you like the third person then mentioned books and not use Amazon. Yeah. Check out your local bookstores, particularly local black bookstores. And find Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History by Michelle Rolfe Truyot. Generally about the ways the Haitian Revolution has been written out of global history and what that means and why. Spoiler, it's because it's proof of the strength of Black resistance and the existence of it. But he also talks quite a bit about Columbus in American history and the Alamo for the other Texans out there who didn't learn about how the Texas Revolution was actually just the Confederacy, but smaller and before. Read this book and you'll learn about that. Yeah, great book, very readable. Yeah, but not something I was introduced to at Tulane. I will say I did later in my education get the chance to take a class on ethics in American politics, which was really important and has inspired me since the question like why we don't have classes like that in architecture. That was also the only class in political science I ever had that was taught by a Black woman faculty. 
remember it was that professor and Dr. Wiley in architecture were the only two black women faculty I had throughout all of college. But yeah, it was, that was a good class that I had later. And then through going into classes like that, I think was where I finally in my fifth year, as I also, I misrecalled earlier, I took the Urban Build Studio in which I met Brian Bradshaw in fifth year, not fourth. And then the fourth the fifth year, I got into the history department and took an African history class that was very important as well to kind of introducing me to post-colonial studies and African history that I was not previously at all aware of. Also important in that I was taught that class by a white professor who gave me and the other students in it, I think, a pretty good background on why it is important as white people to be studying and understanding and teaching African histories, Black histories, because people will continually question why we do. I, I went to school in Boston. And mm-hmm. one thing that blew my mind is that they blew up mountains to infill. Well, I guess it was a thing because they did that in D.C. too. They mm-hmm. infill to make the monuments and stuff. And how d- destructive we were. I say we, but yeah. how destructive <laughs> they were to create this ideology. Yeah. So there's a Du Bois quote from his, I think it's like 19th article, The Souls of White Folk, that I go back to again and again, which is, uh, whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. The ways that a white colonial, if the people doing it are gods and have the ability and the right to shape the earth however we want it to be and is necessary to make the world the way we want it to be. And that's really bad and unhealthy, like psychologically and obviously to us and also for the people who are displaced, hurt, affected, killed often by it. A uh, controversial book recommendation, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Check it out from the library. Don't buy it. It is absolute garbage in so many ways. But yeah, I would specifically recommend like white people. We should read that book, white designers, like read that book with a critical eye and recognize that we're being trained to be the asshole architect in that book. Like all design practice and whiteness and particularly patriarchy teaches us that we are supposed to act like that guy. The characters model that they're frankly right, apparently. But uh, yeah, I could recap it if you want, but I don't really want to. It's just about really, art. I remember trying to read that book in high school because at the time they had like a scholarship or something. And yeah. I was like, oh, let me just read this books about architecture and, and I could learn something. And I hated that book. It's terrible. It is a horrible book. It was not meant for me to read. And he's shaking his head. No, it's not. And like, it's, it's meant for me to read as a white man and to uh, internalize the dominance that the character, the architect character in that book practices and to practice it in his personal and professional lives and to practice it without questioning and then just to be selfish assholes to everyone. It's real bad. And read it with some psychological preparation. And then if it's a library book, return it. But if you happen to own it or like come across a used copy, read it and then burn it. So other people will not have to read it. And eventually, <laughs> if we all do that, we will have no copies of that book left. And it'll be gone. You have students now and you reflected on being an 18, 19 year old you. This cur- a curious person just trying to figure out life and how yeah. you have any advice or what was the situation if there was one yeah so one's definitely for faculty too and a lesson that I learned from Scott Ruff as I did many things about teaching when I was a sophomore and in Scott's studio I was also coming out as gay which was the most difficult semester that I had in my academic life for sure harder than thesis just like Emotionally and psychologically, a very difficult time. I didn't talk about it to any faculty, not to him or anyone else at that time. Just came out to a couple of students who I was in school with and gradually to more over time. But yeah, Scott did not know that, but he was a very kind and thoughtful and supportive professor anyway. And to the other professors out there, like, be like that. Treat your students with grace and kindness and be supportive and you don't necessarily know what they're going through or where they're coming from or what they're experiencing, act as if they're all going through the worst semester of their lives. And they probably won't tell you what's going on. It's just 
how they act at that age, most of them. But you can still do a lot to be a kind and caring person in their lives. And that matters a lot. And that's one thing that architecture school does not do at all, is that they are not kind, to say the least. And I never understood where that mentality originated from. I don't know if you know or... I think it comes from the workplace. I think it's preparing architects or students for the demands of workplaces where they will be sucked dry of their labor and their capacity to labor. Because it's not like their creative energy. Most of us don't go on to incredibly creative jobs, especially not right out of school. We draft. We do clerical tasks. We staple reports, things like that. I think the harsh conditions of architecture school are really just preparing us to do that without questioning it, which is really shitty, but that's capitalism. And yeah, that's kind of where I feel it comes from. I think it would be too kind to say that it comes out of creative drive to achieve or something. I think that's what we tell ourselves, but it's really just a function of labor under capitalism. To to work your butt off for no reason, essentially. And we're pitted against each other to be told that we're doing it to achieve better than someone else when like that's just a pretend way to get us to work harder against each other and to undermine our solidarity if we collectively recognize that we're in these terrible conditions of education or work then we can actually do something about it but if we're just suffering individually without collectively recognizing our capacity to i don't know withhold our labor we can't really do much about it another thing too that i mentioned that i have on My little list is my experience with going to New Orleans, which is one time, unfortunately. It was at the AIA convention when it was down there. I'm curious, what was your opinion when Katrina hit and it became displacing black and brown people? And then here we come as architects. We're going to rebuild. (laughs) No, go ahead. Yeah, we're going to rebuild. Like, what's give me a play by play. What's going on in your head? So Katrina was the first week of my sixth grade year. That meant that I didn't know much about the world yet, but I read the news a lot. And so I was coming into an awareness that, as I mentioned at the beginning, would really be reinforced by Ms. Gratton, my seventh grade English teacher, Mr. Salmon, my history teacher, Guayo, my 10th grade history teacher, and other educators and my grandparents as well. Racism exists and is fucked up. And Katrina was the initial moment when mainstream white media were people talking about that. Probably the first one that I remember seeing people talking about racism that still exists, maybe, in the media after Katrina. And I remember Kanye West saying George Bush doesn't care about Black people. I don't remember that much else specifically from that time, besides people talking about racism openly and Kanye West also doing the same. But The idea that architecture had a response to it, I probably didn't think about as much personally until coming to Tulane in 2012 in the spring to check out the school to potentially attend it because I heard a very hard sell from the school about what I would later come to know as public interest design, particularly a design build program called Urban Build that is still in existence at the Tulane School of Architecture where students provide free labor that they actually pay for the privilege of working on the Katrina that ended up debuting for the store. It was about specifically storm recovery rebuilding, building new contemporary houses in storm damaged neighborhoods, which put sort of in the same vein as the famous Make It Right project in the overnight board, probably the emblem of post Katrina. And I was really sold on that at the time because I was a young white person who was starting to understand racial injustice and my role as a white person going into a professional field and thinking that well, there's something that's being done and I can participate in hear what's going on when you look at a lot of people who did post-Katrina rebuilding in New Orleans in six and seven later went to Haiti to do after 2011. It would not be too harsh of me to say, I think, that it's sort of a parasitic culture that moves on from neoliberal disaster damaged place, disaster damaged place. There's a whole area of disaster scholarship that I've been getting into quite a lot more recently. 
because of how absolutely necessary it is to understand, particularly being here in New Orleans. But I now can kind of say, like, I understand disasters aren't caused by nature. Disasters are a function of the social conditions that exist when natural events happen. The disaster of Katrina wasn't that there was a hurricane or even that the levees broke. It's that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of poor and Black people were put in positions to drown, starve, be murdered by police in the aftermath of that storm. Disasters are social. And the attempts of architects to rebuild in the wake of storms without challenging the underlying political conditions that create disasters are really vain, self-serving, and short-sighted. They're not supposed to solve the problem. They're supposed to create good photography for magazines. That's what they do often as well. Um, feel good thing. It is is definitely a feel good type to give purpose. I'm helping them feeding kids and in Africa type type deal. I remember when they were actively doing the competition and all these main brand architects were getting in on it and the designs and so forth. And there were even some shows, I think it was shows or TV news clips or whatever. And they'll have like the black family and they walk in and they're like, oh, this is nice. And I'm like, no, it's not. (laughs) It is not nice. It became a showcase of these architects and here to save the poor black and brown people. One thing I was surprised to, you said it too, that reminded me of it is that you pay the play for people who have money and want to change something, but don't, well, I mean, none of us individually can overthrow colonial capitalism, but we can pay money and get the illusion that we're improving conditions in countries that are, have for generations been extracted from. Like I raised Haiti partly because there's the 2008 earthquake, which was another like big moment in the public interest design boom, but also because Haiti has continually been extracted from since it won its independence by France, the United States, by these global imperialist capitalist powers, there's a reason why there's not much money in that country and why it has political stability. It's because European countries and the United States have taken the money consistently. Haiti had to pay reparations to France for billions of dollars after winning its independence in 1804. That's why there are these conditions of poverty in places like Haiti and across the global south. It's because they're extracted from And no public interest design project or volunteering is going to change that. Yeah, the capacity to actually change these conditions is like far beyond what architects ourselves can achieve, either as individuals or as practices or as a discipline as a whole. I have, after some time in public interest design and design justice practice, really come to struggle with that because I want to be part of a racial justice movement in architecture. I want to challenge colonialism and capitalism through architecture, but there's real limitations to what we can actually do through our work. And there's a really toxic way that we can apply that same Ayn Rand fountainhead idea that we're the great people who change history to public interest design and design justice practice. If we work hard enough as design activists, we can actually change the world because we're so great because we're architects. But I don't think that that's true. I think our role in the struggle comes from the way we can employ our particular skills in service of activists and liberation movements. But that's not as glamorous a role. We're the people who come to save you. I'd love to hear more about what your experience in New Orleans back when you came here for the AIA conference was like. Since I was in Austin then and wouldn't come here for another couple of years. I'm always fascinated to hear what the city was like at that time. My point of view was a hip hop point of view. Little Wayne, his baby mama. I went, Toya, I think that's her name. She had a store. So I went and found the store and I bought a t-shirt. I walked down the knife ward. I saw the giant wall, the Mm -hmm. levee. And then the stark difference with like Bourbon Street. I was surprised that you couldn't have an open container. I was like, really? You could just walk around Mm -hmm. with beer in your hand? That was new to me. The fact that you can go all night, all night, I love that. I was right in the middle of everything. I'm aware, being a Black female, I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm aware where I'm with, who I'm with, all that stuff. So I do enjoy the city. I don't know how it is to live there. 
And I don't know how it is outside. I live in Maryland and occasionally I would, it seems like more frequently, I would travel north, west. And that section of Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, all Trump country. It's Trump country. There's really no difference in areas of Baltimore to the counties like PG County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, how the blue versus white is the same. Only thing is, is I'm more comfortable in the blue areas because it's more of me than if I go up Northwest, I have to be somebody else. Does that make sense? And I think that no matter where I go, I have to decide which Melissa I'm going to be, which is annoying. That's a little bit deeper than what you asked me about how I feel about No, I'm really glad it ended up there, though. I mean, that's actually an experience I can relate to a little bit. Like, I'll never know what it's like to be a Black woman in any setting, much less a professional setting. But I do know what it's like to be in an unwelcoming and at least at times like unwelcoming and trying to do work outside of it and in my spare time that is sustaining me and bringing me joy and showing me that there could be a better future. It's interesting because uh, any city has a lot of layers and one of New Orleans' layers is like there's some old time conservative business atmospheres and the architecture firm I started working after college really was one of those. It was like everyone, almost everyone, I wear a tie, but most people wear a tie to work every day. Really? And yeah. At a, a relatively small architecture development office where nearly everyone was a man out of 10 or 11 people at the time I was there, nine or 10 of us were a man at any point. And when I was starting to work there during college, I wasn't thinking as critically about gender and how it played a role in my life, nor as a work, in a work environment. But I think that that's a big change that I kind of came into consciousness about the impacts of gender on my life more and how I experienced gender as a man and as a cisgender gay man, partly through that experience and becoming more aware of that experience of a work environment, how toxic and masculine it could be often of men yelling at each other and men being passive aggressively frustrated at each other and not to be gender essentialist about men arguing and women not arguing. But I do think that there's a lot of toxic masculinity in that workplace and I have found working in the office where I am currently at Tulane, where I'm the only man out of an office, of about 10 people. It's just a far more caring environment where people, yeah, genuinely show care and respect for each other in a way I was not used to in that workplace. But yeah, while I was there in my professional office environment, I also was working, both doing advocacy and activist work and working for a design justice practice called Collocate, which is was at the time run by Brian Lee and Sue Mobley. Really wonderful people, inspiring practitioners. Yeah, I definitely am grateful to have had that experience. But yeah, because of like where I'd put myself coming out of like working at the architecture office and coming out of college and working there, my concerns about what my family wanted for me and needing money and stability kind of kept me living a day job life while also doing other projects and every free waking moment that I had for a couple of years. And yeah, that's also kind of where I got into Noma, which I can talk about a little bit more as well. I was first introduced to it through Brian Bradshaw because we sat next to each other in the studio in 2016 as he and a couple of other grad students were organizing a chapter at Tulane, which hadn't had one previously since the early 2000s, I believe before Katrina. And I got involved in doing a exhibition project on campus in the spring of 2017, a very politicized time on campus when I was doing my thesis. And then that was kind of a moment of leadership transition for Noma, Louisiana, when the old people were, the people who'd previously been leading were sort of having kids or stepping away from the organization. So it kind of fell to Brian and myself and a couple other folks to carry on the chapter and particularly a project pipeline camp, which I believe will be going into its 11th year next summer. Also something I was first introduced to by Scott Ruff, who recommended I check it out when I was still a student and be a mentor in, but that camp has also been a huge part of why I wanted to go into teaching because 
it influenced my thesis, which was about sort of racial justice and design education. It has been a continuing source of mentorship for me, for me to practice mentorship, to also practice like knowing what is and isn't my place as a white person in that space and organization to make friends and build solidarity and trust and community with people. Yeah, Project Pipeline is the best. And I'm really grateful to have been a part of it since 2014 here. Yeah, but I've been a lot more involved in the past few years, working with Brian and a couple other folks to put on our camp and occasional like workshops during the school year too. Have you had any alumni come back? To the camp? Yeah. So we have one student right now. Uh, her name is Destiny. Destiny was a four-year camper who's now in her second year as an architecture student at LSU. So she's back as a mentor at our two virtual camps. And I'm really looking forward to her being able to mentor at our in-person camp that we're hopefully going to do next summer. Virtual camps have been a challenge and I have so much admiration and love for everyone, NOMA across the country, particularly the South region folks who we've been teamed up with, but for making the virtual camp work and like us doing it together, it's helped a lot, but I'm really looking forward to getting back to in-person camp next summer. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap up? Let's see. I could talk about the Richardson thing, actually. Ah, let's talk about that. So it actually goes way back too. when I was in elementary school, my dad had an assignment from the Texas Historical Commission to go photograph historic courthouses across Texas that are being restored. There are a number of Richardsonian Romanesque county courthouses across Texas. Richardson himself didn't design any of them. They were mostly designed in the years after he died, late 1880s, early 1890s. But I think partly because they're a lot smaller scale than a lot of Richardson's buildings, they're really beautiful. These delicate, intricate, sort of like kind of cathedral buildings in the middle of town squares across rural Texas. So I went with my dad as he did photography of these buildings. And that was another influence on me early on, definitely to think about both architecture and government and government architecture, too, as well as the importance of historic architecture and preservation. One thing I was not thinking about at that time, which I've gotten more into as I've been studying reconstruction over the past couple of years, is Jim Crow and how the fact that these are the architectural products of Jim Crow government is inscribed in them and in the spaces around them. I think I first became a little bit aware of that when reading about the Black Freedom Movement in the South, like the Deep South, as opposed to Texas, which doesn't identify as being Southern, though many parts of it are, where courthouse squares were a big contested space where there was a lot of activists going to register to vote and holding marches on courthouse squares in places like Selma, Alabama. Yeah, and seeing courthouses as this political space of racial justice struggle made me think back to what I'd learned as a kid about Texas courthouses and wonder if there'd been similar events happening there. And sort of at the same time, coming to understand the history and legacy of lynching, which often was also perpetrated on courthouse squares. And then more recently, so I, I've done some like writing about that, put together a lecture that I did at the Rice School of Architecture last year about it, which is pretty fascinating. Shout out to Anzi Gilmore of Houston Noma, who helped make that go off a uh, really great time. But yeah, I have in the past year and a half through work with Michelle Barrett and Mian Wen, Kelly Dawes, Brian Bradshaw, and a number of other folks, mostly in the Tulane, but also broader Noma networks, done a lot of work through Emergent Grounds and Design Education, which we'll be talking about with Michelle, looking forward to that in the future. Emerging Grounds and Design Education has crossed many areas of the built environment, but one has been kind of getting into discussions about abolition and what the prison industrial complex is in the built environment and how the broader, like beyond jails and prisons aspects of it show up in the built environment, as well as what abolition of prisons policing can look like in the built environment. And with all these things in my mind recently, someone was tweeting a picture of some Richardson, Ro Richardsonian Romanesque building. And I was like, whoa, I haven't like accessed the part of my brain that used to love Richardsonian Romanesque architecture since I've been thinking about abolition of prisons and policing heavily. And since I've been like, we all went through the thing about classical style Trump 
executive order stuff. I think a lot of that conversation was a waste of time. There's a lot of people who probably got too tied up in it. There's parts of it that are important, but I think we spend too much time thinking about the style of buildings and not their function, often particularly on Twitter, which I do too, I know. But uh, thinking about both at the same time is what I think we should be doing. And there are plenty of people who do. So I was trying to practice that and considering, man, I really love the way these buildings say the Allegheny County Courthouse, Richardson's masterpiece, courthouse and jail, Richardson's masterpiece in Pittsburgh is also this really oppressive building. And architecturally, we can use all these words like heavy and like domineering to describe the building. And like, I still like the way it looks, but now I have to understand it as this piece of oppressive architecture that has incarcerated people, which people have probably died, and which is tied to the system of racist capitalist oppression that I want to fight against as a designer. So yeah, I was tweeting that thread of a number of different Richardson Roman Richardsonian Romanesque buildings, partly to just dig into that idea about how I love how these buildings look and they're terrible. But that was all like the one at Trinity Church. That was the one that exposed me to H.H. Richardson, the Trinity Church one. And I loved sketching that. It was so detailed. And so when I saw your thread, I never thought about it that way. I don't know. I guess I was looking, I was clouded in the architecture-esque of it to even dig deeper into the context you were presenting. And I mean, it goes deeper too. And the like, Tulane's architecture building is called Richardson Memorial. It's in the Richardsonian Romanesque architecture style, not for Richardson himself, but for members of his family, because his family was a very wealthy sugar plantation owning family in the river parishes up, up the Mississippi from New Orleans, which meant that they enslaved hundreds of people. And the money that they gave to name build buildings at Tulane came from the labor of enslaved people on land stolen from indigenous people right here in this region. And Richardson was born and raised during enslavement, his family's enslaved labor camp, and was in Boston actually at college during the Civil War. So did not fight for the Confederacy as probably everyone who he grew up with, or many people he grew up with definitely did. A lot of rich people also got out of fighting for the Confederacy in a lot of ways. But uh, he escaped being a Confederate, literally, but his whole life and wealth and privilege and access to what he had was certainly built on his family's fortune. And so how do we reconcile that with the beauty of his architecture? A long time ago, gave up on thinking that you could separate the artist from the art, because I don't think you can. But I also don't know how to reckon with it together. And I spent a lot of time in like, the world of Jim Crow monuments and monument removal as activists and advocate around public art and removing Jim Crow public art. And I am definitely a believer in the removal of racist statues and monuments to create space for other stories to be told through public art. When it comes to buildings and buildings that have an origin story in such circumstances as Richardson's, I don't really know what to do with it. Come back to me in a couple of years. I don't know either. There was a conversation that I had with a friend of mine and he got a hold of some old drawings, original drawings. And in the restroom portion, it said whites only. And it sparked something in him. And he took it on a Facebook post because he likes Facebook. Why? People still do. Even people are. I mean, I still have mine, Same. but only... I belong to a lot of things and they have Facebook groups. So that's the only reason why I still have mine is so I could interact in the groups. But, but anyways, I digress. So it's like pen to paper. An architect actually wrote down for white only bathrooms and colored mm -hmm. bathrooms. And that was fine with him. Social norm at the time. And even when Henry here, he did what he did because that was the norm. I think that when it comes to statues, you're honoring the person. When it comes to building, it's more towards the client than anything else. Because, you know, architects are just pawns. We're just, we do whatever the pimp tells us to do. We don't have all the power that we often think we do. Yeah, right. That's why we try to save the world through our architecture. I'll throw out 
one thing you made me uh, remember, which was an image that I use in some of my teaching of a group of picketers outside SOM's office on Park Avenue in New York in 1970 of a group called the Architects Resistance, which was a mostly white student activist group of people at like Columbia, Yale, Northeastern universities mainly is what I've read about them. I'm sure that they were at other places too. And they organized around opposition to the Vietnam War, as a lot of students were at that time, but also against American architecture firms work in South Africa. So the picketers in this photo are protesting SOM's work on the Carlton Center, which is a big modernist skyscraper that until recently was the tallest building in the continent of Africa that was a headquarters of a mining conglomerate that, yeah, they were protesting the fact that SOM's work was for this company whose labor practices and certainly like adherence to apartheid laws was upholding the regime in South Africa before the later South African divestment movement, but also sort of in the wake of legal six years after the banning of segregated public accommodations in the United States. But it makes me think, as enthusiastic as I am to see that there were designers, particularly white designers, who were picketing something like this in 1970 when it was happening in South Africa, like, why weren't they doing it in 1950 when it was happening in the United States? What were designers thinking in, like, I think the federal government was segregated in the Wilson administration, so like 1912 or 13-ish, where there are architects who objected to having to design segregated buildings in the 1900s and 19-teens when Jim Crow was first being enforced architecturally. But I guess, yeah, there were, to kind of answer my own question, I guess, and that's one fascinating thing about the history of architecture activism. If you tell it only through what white people were doing, you're missing the vast majority of the story. And I didn't learn about the HBCU tradition at Tulane, hardly at all, a little bit, but it was more things I learned after through the NOMA network. And yeah, certainly Black architects were not designing Jim Crow buildings or not designing buildings that had Jim Crow public accommodations. Well, that's a good question. I mean, some probably did. Like, I know that- I I wouldn't, I probably. Yeah. If I asked the right questions to the right person, I'd probably find the answer. You ever seen 12 Years a Slave? Yeah, I haven't either because I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be mad. And that's why certain things I don't dig in or try to think Mm -hmm. too much of it because it's uh i mean you could think and feel what you want but when i go back in time and i think about yeah. all these things that's happening i always think about where would i be in that space the whole black trauma and how hollywood mm-hmm. likes to celebrate that last year black lives movement everybody was getting killed like all that stuff was happening the initial response versus it, it always takes that one white company firm Mm -hmm. whatever to do the right thing and then everybody follows suit I tend to I'm so busy shutting down than to actually process how you how you are processing things so I don't know why I said all that it just parts me to say that yeah I've learned that I like to be able to talk about history in ways that is relevant to the present that like I will read books about history all day if you let me, but I don't think that it's necessarily something that's like worth me talking about to other people all the time. Certainly not teaching unless I can find ways to relate it to the present. But don't history repeat itself though? Oh, absolutely. And that's part of, I think, the job of a uh, effective educator about history is to find the patterns and to explain them in ways that make sense. The the research that I'm doing, the area where I grew up in, like I mentioned, housing project, and it was part of urban renewal. It was an area where a lot of Black people lived, like workers, servants, that type of thing. It was like shanty type towns. I don't want to say makeshift. I don't, there's probably other words for it, but that area has always been Black, right? Only now, white people started moving in simply because it's the proximity to the metro, public transportation, downtown, government buildings, so forth. But that area has always been turned over. It's always been demolish, rebuild, demolish, Mm -hmm. rebuild versus other areas hasn't even been touched in like centuries. And and in, in order for you to touch it, there's a ginormous process for you to go through. 
versus where I grew up, it's like, we're just going to take the land. We'll take it. White economic power freezes urban space in amber and then dictates that other spaces where poor people live, spaces where Black people of just about any economic class live, spaces where immigrants live, those are going to be the spaces that are changed to meet white economic powerful people's needs spaces where they live always get to stay the same i think about that a lot in new orleans about like yeah there's neighborhoods here that have been demolished and rebuilt three times over now while the neighborhoods around tulane have stayed exactly the same since exactly. they were. that level of stability is also part of the problem and i think that's been a place that i at least theoretically try to intervene in with some of the writing and research that i do wrote a paper recently first paper I've written to get published in a a journal about a Black university that was started during Reconstruction on a piece of land in uptown New Orleans next to Tulane that was thrived for about 50 years. It was started by white Baptist missionaries from New York, but over time, Black Louisiana Baptists challenged the white leadership and like won some control of the institution. And partly in response to those challenges to white leadership, the paternalistic white directors of the school, and also because of the Jim Crow order emerging and of pressure of urban development from Tulane and Loyola universities, white developers wanting the land that it was on, and a hurricane in 1915. The university, which is a Leland University, was sold demolished, and then a expensive subdivision built on top of it, or on top of the land, which had a racist covenant embedded in the restrictions of how you could and couldn't develop on it. And so the transformation of that space, like to walk around uptown New Orleans, you would think that it was always like that, actually. But to understand that, no, it wasn't. And what happened here instead was an act of in- very intentional erasure because like you would think that that's a historical story that's like worth telling or worth knowing something about. But there's no plaque, and no commemoration, nothing at all to tell that story in the space, nor about the fact that that school was displaced to north of Baton Rouge, but then continued existing for another 40 years and educated generations of Black, particularly Louisiana teachers. Yeah, there's so much richness that is erased through that process. And I've been grateful to start learning about it. But I also feel like it can be easy to miss the point and just think that it's a theoretical intervention of like, yeah, we're imagining, as I've tried to do with my projects, imagining what if there was a reparation of that land to the descendants of the university, the Black leaders of the university who took it over after 1920. I get caught between the theoretical interest in promoting that as a project and then the reality of yeah, these are real people's lives and real people's stories. And I don't actually have any connection to them beyond just being a person interested in it. So it's not my story to tell. Yeah, that's hard. That's really hard. I feel like that too. The neighborhood I grew up in, I don't live there anymore. I have no idea what the people want. No idea what the community needs. I could speculate, but yeah. I don't belong to that community anymore. It's been decades since I've been there. Yeah. It is a set of relationships. We throw around that word so much in our design practices as a community engagement. But to come in and give a meeting and show pictures of a project you want to do has nothing to do with community. I'm physically present in this space, but community is a much more complex thing than the people who live in a space together. That's probably one of the most important concepts I've learned out of planning is to challenge the surface level understanding of community that I was taught as an architect. To think of context as more than the surrounding buildings, but not only the people around the space, but the relationships between the people and how they organize themselves. Yeah. Shout out to planning people. Gigi, Davis Williams. Some of those are landscape people, but I learned a lot from y'all. Oh my gosh, that's a good point too, because it's a farce. I post this image that I got on Twitter, on Instagram, and I think I said it too on Twitter. Um, Like, where's the design in this? It was a block. You know how we do, how we like to do our new apartment buildings, square over square, layer over layer. And then you have this little existing building, this two-story that once was a home. Now it's turned into a commercial retail place and it doesn't go with anything. So the context is gone because you, you're you going to build what you're going to build. But where's the community in that? It drives me insane. What they teach us in school in design 
you look at the contacts, at least for me, I can't speak for anybody else. You mm-hmm. look at the contacts, you analyze, you think about the neighborhood and you think about the problem and you figure out the solution physically. It's like, no one does that anymore. That shit is just straight out the window. I'm going to build what I want to build to maximize the space, whatever the client wants. Fuck context. And I also don't know if that's new. The fact that we would question in the first place, I think comes out of very powerful residual effects of like activist movements and architecture and planning commonly get dated back to the 1960s, but particularly going through black design and planning traditions go back a lot farther than that. The fact that we would question top-down design and planning at all, or be concerned with context, I don't think that, yeah, that rejection of context or care for community and other people is new. I think it's, it was Robert Moses, it was Daniel Burnham in the plane of Chicago, it was colonialism. I mean, broadly, the idea that this entire continent of existing societies, that context doesn't matter and we're just going to come build these new cities here. It's a very deeply rooted idea. And the fact that we still question it, I think, is something to hold on to, uh, something to appreciate and expand on our capacity to do that whenever we can. Sometimes it's all we can do is to question and try and keep alive the memory that something else used to be there. But yeah, we can't, can't stop the machine as it rolls on and develops and changes our cities forever. Last question for you. Do you think they were able to, and this is an architectural education question, do you think we would be able to change the way we teach in architecture school? Definitely. I've been really inspired by changes I've seen over the past couple years, particularly people coming out of places like Dark Matter University, the networks of practitioners in designers' protests, and even people who are further out of the spotlight than that. As simple as there's a lot of small, not glamorous changes that can make a big difference in the way we do teaching in design schools. Like last Wednesday, I went to a really wonderful final review for uh, Professor Fallon Adu at University of New Orleans, heavily underfunded public university. And rather than have us do a jury where we would critique students' projects and have everybody sit in the back and like fall asleep, especially because it's like 6 p.m. because these are students who work during the day, do their master's program at night for urban design. It was a gallery format where we just walked around, talked to students, drank uh, White Claw and ate Cheez-Its. And it was such a humanizing experience, like that dignified the students work as art rather than something to be attacked and critiqued. And I, I think I've probably done that once or twice in school before, but I was really reminded how powerful small, relatively small procedural changes like that can be in shifting the psychology of design school from this attacking critique culture to a culture of constructive criticism and conversation and mutual interest and improvement. Hmm. That's possible. People are doing it right now. And these are students who were mostly in their first semester of school. And so Professor Adu like really made time to show her appreciation for how far they'd come and for the fact that we had a major hurricane uh, hit this region four months ago at the beginning of September, the anniversary of Katrina on August 29th. And that's had a huge effect on the lives of everyone here, whether we talk about it or not. And at the close of the review, Fallon just named that and said, I know we've been through a lot this semester. That acknowledgement that we're humans who experience things outside of the design studio that affect us and that we can, yeah, we don't stop being humans when we go into design studio Mm -hmm. and design education is really key and important. I believe people across the country and across the world can do it. I've seen it done at this institution at University of New Orleans where lack of resources is absolutely no excuse. The state's legislature starves the University of New Orleans every year and Fallon's doing amazing things there with her students. And y'all listen at like GSD, Yale, Princeton, Tulane. Y'all can all do a lot better than what y'all are doing. You don't need to traumatize students absolutely unnecessary to creating good designers. It is necessary if you're trying to make a compliant labor force, but that's another question to get into. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Listeners, I have an exciting announcement. I decided to launch a membership program for the show. 
where you have a chance to support me and the show directly. I love creating the show and it means the world to me that you all tune in to keep hearing me week after week. But it takes an immense amount of time and energy to produce. I want to keep the show going and I want to invest in its growth. And I also want you to become a partner with me in this journey. That's why I'm excited to give you a chance to officially become a supporter of the show at glow.fm slash archispolly, A-R-C-H-I-S-P-O-L-L-Y, or by clicking the link in the show notes. It's quick and easy. It takes less than 30 seconds and just takes clicking a link in the show notes and using Apple or Google Pay. You don't have to create any new logins and you can contribute as much or as little as you like. If this show is part of your day or week and you like what I'm doing, then visit glow.fm slash arches all one word and support me and the show in any way you can today.